meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. They do not nor know nor understand. A deceived heart has turned him aside. That's from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9 through 20. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies that the maker of its mold should trust in it, is to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, Awake, to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 18 through 20. Their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they, nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. Psalms 115 verses 4 through 8. Every metal smith is put to shame by the carved image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Jeremiah 51 verse 17 through 18. The attitude of the founders towards Hindus may be seen in the attitude toward the Native American tribal groups that populated the North American continent at that time. Like Hindus, the Indians believed in many deities. In a letter dated May 2, 1788, addressed to a Moravian preacher named John Edwin. George Washington applauded the efforts of a Christian organization whose stated mission efforts were for the purpose of propagating the gospel among the heathen. So far, I am capable of judging the principles upon which the society is founded and the rules laid down for its government appear to be well calculated to promote so, so laudable and arduous an undertaking and you will permit me to add that if an event so long and so earnestly desired as that of converting the Indians to Christianity and consequently to civilization can be affected, the Society of Bethlehem bids fair to bear a very considerable a part in it. The exclusivity of Christianity also was made clear by General Washington during the Revolutionary War when he delivered a speech to the Delaware Indian chiefs on May 12, 1779. You do well to wish to learn our arts and ways of life and above all the religion of Jesus Christ. These will make you a greater and happier people than you are. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention and to tie the knot of friendship and union so fast that nothing shall ever be able to loose it. Another example of the Founders' view of non-Christian religion is the discussion that took place on the floor of the North Carolina State Convention that met to debate ratification of the Federal Constitution. On Wednesday, July 30th, 1778, Henry Abbott, a minister, articulated serious concerns entertained by some of the delegates. They were unconvinced that the Constitution 
provided the same guarantees as the state constitution for citizens to practice Christianity. According to their own interpretation of the Bible, without interference from the federal government. They also were concerned that the absence of fixed religious test oaths might eventually be misconstrued to allow people who embrace false religions or even atheisms to make encroachments. Some are afraid, Mr. Chairman, that should the Constitution be received, they would be deprived of the privilege of worshiping God according to their conscience, which would be taken from a benefit they enjoy under the present Constitution. They wish to know if their religious and civil liberties be secured under this system, or whether the general government may not make laws infringing their religious liberties. The exclusion of religious tests is by many thought dangerous and impolitic. They suppose that if there be no religious test required, pagans, deists, and Mohammedans might obtain offices amongst us, and that the senators and representatives might all be pagans. I would be glad if some gentlemen would endeavor to obviate these objections in order to satisfy the religious part of the society. To their thinking, Hindus were included under the label pagans. A response to Abbott was offered by James Aradell, who since the revolution had served the state of North Carolina both as a judge on the state superior court as well as state attorney general, and was soon to be appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court by George Washington. Mr. Chairman, Nothing is more desirable than to remove the scruples of any gentleman on this interesting subject. Those concerning religion are entitled to particular respect. He proceeded to explain at length that the establishment of one Christian sect above another always had led to persecution and war, as evidenced in Catholic countries as well as by the Church of England from which they only recently had intrinsicated themselves. Consequently, the restriction placed on Congress in the federal constitution would prevent the government from interfering with the free practice of the Christian religion. He then remarked, but is it objected that the people of America may perhaps choose representatives who have no religion at all? and that pagans and Mohammedans may be admitted into offices. But how is it possible to exclude any set of men without taking away that principle of religious freedom which we ourselves so warmly contend for? This is the foundation on which persecution has been raised in every part of the world. The people in power were always right and everybody else wrong. If you admit the least difference, the door to persecution is opened, nor would it answer the purpose for the worst part of the excluded sex would comply with the test, and the best men only be kept out of our councils. Observe that Iridil conceded that in order for the Constitution to guarantee Christians the right to worship God according to their own conscience, non-Christians inevitably would be permitted the same constitutional protection. Indeed, as previously noted, the founders never would have countenanced the persecution of atheists or those who espoused non-Christian religions. Are we to assume from this observation, however, that the founders held non-Christian religions, like Hinduism, in high regard or that they encourage non-Christian religions in the public sector, or that they sanctioned all religions as equally authentic and credible? Absolutely not, as Iridil further explained. But it is never to be supposed that the people of America will trust their dearest rights to persons who have no religion at all, or a religion materially different from their own. 
It would be happy for mankind if religion was permitted to take its course and maintain itself by the excellence of its own doctrines. The divine author of our religion never wished for its support by worldly authority. Has he not said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? It made such greater progress for itself than when supported by the greatest authority upon earth. Ireno reasoned that leaving the Constitution non-specific with regard to religion would prevent religious persecution. Further, tolerating non-Christian religions would not endanger the Founders' assumption that Christianity would remain the worldview and moral framework that undergirds the nation. Why? because he felt confident that Americans never would endanger their dearest rights by voting non-Christians, whether atheists, Muslims, or Hindus, into government. Inviting a Hindu to offer prayer in Congress is a step in that very direction. And did you notice Iridale's allusion to the divine author of our religion? What author and what religion do you suppose he intended? He quoted that author in his very next sentence. Has he not said that the gates of the hell shall not prevail against it? Those words are the words of Jesus Christ, as recorded in Matthew 16, 18. The author to whom he referred was Christ, and Christ is the author of only one religion, Christianity, not Hinduism. Irido next discoursed on the essentiality of an oath to be taken by those who wish to serve in the government. He insisted that this oath should contain two critical components, belief in a supreme being, and belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. He even cited a legal case in England that occurred some 40 years earlier pertaining to a person who was admitted to take an oath according to the rights of his own country. Though he was a heathen, he was an East Indian who had a great suit in chancery, and his answer upon oath to a bill filed against him was absolute necessary. Not believing either in the Old or New Testament, he would not be sworn in the accustomed manner, but was sworn according to the form of the Gento religion, which he professed by touching the foot of a priest. He appeared that according to the tenets of this religion, its members believed in a supreme being and in a future state of rewards and punishments. It was accordingly held by the judges upon great consideration that the oath might be received. They considering that it was probable those of that religion were equally bound in conscience by an oath according to their form of swearing as they themselves were by one of theirs and that it would be a reproach to the justice of the country. If a man merely because he was of a different religion from their own should be denied redress of an injury he had sustained. Ever since this great case, it has been universally considered that in administering an oath, it is only necessary to acquire if the person who is to take it believes in a supreme being and in the future state of rewards and punishments. If he does, the oath is to be administered accordingly to the form which it is supposed will bind his conscience most. It is, however, necessary that such a belief be entertained, because otherwise there would be nothing to bind his conscience that would be relied on, since there are many cases where the terror of punishment in this world for perjury will not be dreaded. Gento, a corruption of the Portuguese term gentil, meaning heathen or gentile, was coined by Europeans to refer to the idol-worshipping peoples of India and to distinguish Hindus from Muslims. 
observed that Eridel was not advocating the equal acceptance of Hinduism. He simply offered the only means by which an essential, though non-Christian, witness can serve in a court case. Yet even those remarks are couched in the context of the difficulties posed by those who come to America but refuse to embrace the Christian worldview since our entire justice system depends on a belief in the God of the Bible as well as heaven and hell. The next to speak was the governor of North Carolina, Samuel Johnson. Eight years earlier, he was served as a member of the Continental Congress. He too was astonished that some were concerned that the Constitution provided insufficient guarantees of the priority and free exercise of Protestant religion to the exclusion of competing religions. I read the Constitution over and over but could not see one cause of apprehension or jealousy on this subject. When I heard there were apprehensions that the Pope of Rome could be the President of the United States, I was greatly astonished. It might as well be said that the King of England or France or the Grand Turk, a Muslim, could be chosen to that office. It could have been as good an argument. It appears to me that it would have been dangerous if Congress would intermeddle with the subject of religion. True religion is derived from a, a much higher source than human laws. When any attempt is made by any government to restrain men's conscience, no good consequence can possibly follow. Observe that the governor argued that the odds of a non-Protestant getting into office were so infinitesimal as to merit little concerns. Also being the one true religion and having the backing of God himself, Christianity can fend for itself without the restraint of human government. But then the governor offered a rather chilling prediction. It is apprehended that Jews, Mohammedans, pagans may be elected to high offices under the government of the United States. Those who are Mohammedans or any others who are not professors of the Christian religion can never be elected to the office of president or other high office, but in one of two cases. First, if the people of America lay aside the Christian religion altogether, it may happen. Should this unfortunately take place, the people will choose such men as think as they do themselves. Another case is, if any persons of such descriptions should, notwithstanding their religion, acquire the confidence and esteem of the people of America by their good conduct and practice of virtue, which they may be chosen, I leave it to the gentleman's candor to judge what probability there is of the people's choosing men of different sentiments from themselves. Does the Constitution allow Americans to elect to political office or invite to conduct prayer in Congress? People who do not profess the Christian religion. Yes, it does. Would America ever actually do that? The Founders' prediction very unlikely and highly improbable. But if it were to happen, it would be most unfortunate, they said. Indeed, inviting a Hindu to lead Congress in prayer is equally unfortunate. Governor Johnson then explained that though each of the 13 states was populated heavily by professors of one or more of the various Protestant denominations, there is no cause of fear that any one religion shall be exclusively established. Further testimony to the fact that the single religion of the United States was almost entirely Christian in the form of Protestant sects, to the exclusion of atheism and world religions such as Hinduism. But David Caldwell, also a minister, rose and reiterated the lingering concern that danger might rise. 
In the first place, he said, there was an invitation for Jews and pagans of every kind to come among us. At some future period, said he, this might endanger the character of the United States. Moreover, even those who do not regard religion acknowledge that the Christian religion is best calculated of all religions to make good members of society on account of its morality. I think then, added he, that in a political view, those gentlemen who formed this constitution should not have given this invitation to Jews and heathens. All those who have any religion are against the immigration of those people from the Eastern Hemisphere. In other words, Jews, pagans, and people from the Eastern Hemisphere, which certainly includes Hindus, would constitute a threat to the religious and moral foundation on which America was founded. They were right. After all, Hinduism is thoroughgoing pantheism. Orthodox Hindus are adamant that the nurture of cows lie at the core of Hindu Dharma, a Sanskrit term that refers to the right way of living or the correct understanding of nature. The cow is alkanya, that which may not be slaughtered. While not necessarily worshipped as a god, Hindu scriptures nevertheless extol the cow as sacred. The world we own Hindu Mahatma Gandhi insisted cow protection is the gift of Hinduism to the world. I will not kill a human being to protect a cow as I will not kill a cow to save a human life, be it ever so precious. My religion teaches me that I should, by personal conduct, instill into the minds of those who might hold different views the conviction that cow killing is a sin and that therefore it ought to be abandoned. The founders did not share such outlandish notions. They believed the evidence for the existence of the one true God of the Bible and the truthfulness of the Christian religion was decisive. Mr. Spencer rose to reaffirm the same two reassurances asserted by Governor Johnston. It is feared that persons of bad principles, deists, atheists, may come into this country, and there is nothing to restrain, restrain them from being eligible to office. He asked if it were reasonable to suppose that the people would choose men without regarding their characters. But in this case, as there is not a religious test required, it leaves religion on the solid foundation of its own inherent validity without any connection with temporal authority. Again, the delegates were concerned about the nation remaining firmly Christian in its overall thrust, but they realized they could not force everyone to take a religious oath without creating conflict. Therefore, they relied on the good sense of the American people to refrain from appointing to political office any who do not possess Christian character. And they assumed Christianity would demonstrate its own credibility and superiority without any help from human government. Governor Johnson brought the discussion to a close with a mickable summary of the mutual sentiments of his delegates as reported in the following words. He admitted a possibility of Jews, pagans, immigrating to the United States. Yet he said they could not be in proportion to the immigration of Christians who should come from other countries that in all probability the children even of such people would be Christians. And that this, with the rapid population of the United States, their zeal for religion and love of liberty would, he trusted, add to the progress of the Christian religion among us. The founders were walking a tight rope. On one hand, they did not want to be coercive in the matter of religion. They did not want to cram Christianity down anyone's throat. They wanted America free of religious persecution. On the other hand, they understood that the truthfulness 
and superiority of the Christian religion was the essential platform on which America's political institutions were poised. So they assuaged their fears by consoling themselves with the thought that the American people would forever have the good sense to retain Christianity as the central religion of the nation and that they would refrain from inviting into their na nationals consuls and halls of government anyone who did not share those religious and moral convictions. These early Americans surely would be incredulous, bewildered and disgusted if they were here to witness a Hindu on the floor of the U.S. Senate chanting a Hindu prayer to gods, which by nature are no gods. The work of men's hands, wood and stone. Galatians 4 verse 8, 2 Kings 19 verse 18. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images who boast of idols. Psalms 97 verse 7. When one compares the Christianity that was practiced by the majority of Americans in early America with the Christianity that is being practiced in 21st American century, one cannot help but marvel at the disparity. Consider the following four contrasts. First, those who professed Christianity in early America 